so I'll try and be brief. Uh, Lauren wanted me to give people an update on what the, the meeting study was this year. Um, as you know, I think since the beginning of the meeting, there's been a study tacked, second year, a study tacked on to the, tacked on to the meeting. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, been mutually beneficial-ish. Uh, there are obviously challenges of doing studies at the meetings and there's some limitations. The last few years, the studies have involved something to do with antibodies, different focus each year. This year, the focus is a little bit different. So, which we'll get to, and my slides look really good up here. I don't know that anyone else can see them, can they? So, this is POTS. Heart rate goes up. So, uh, while we're waiting, oh, there we go. All right, so, you all know, so one of the fundamental um, issues in POTS, or at least the classic sort of hemodynamic problem is that there's an excessive increase in heart rate, and that's what we see here. Um, I don't know if you can see pointer or not. Probably not. So uh, the blood pressure usually doesn't fall a lot, but the heart rate climbs in healthy volunteers a little bit. Um, POTS patients are overachievers, right? The heart rate climbs a lot, and that's associated with a whole bunch of things involving um, generally feeling horrible. You've seen versions of this slide, I'm sure, many times. There are different pathophysiologic mechanisms. One of the issues at play is that POTS isn't a thing, but probably a bunch of things um, that end up looking similar. But one of the subtypes or pathophysiologic groups that keep coming up is a hyperadrenergic state, or is the finding seen in many patients with POTS. And the truth is that there are two different ways of getting to that. One is to release have too much sympathetic nerve traffic and release too much norepinephrine into the synapse, right? So there's just too much coming in. But there's another way that has turned out to be very important in at least two patients, um, and that is that you can have trouble getting rid of the norepinephrine when it's released. So a problem with the clearance of norepinephrine. Um, and that's the focus uh, of the project this year. Uh, this is just a, a cartoon illustrating the too much firing. Um, but the decreased clearance, um, based on a first version of the slides they sent Lauren a while ago, not the recent one. Um, it relates back to a patient that was seen at Vanderbilt almost 20 years ago. Um, and she was studied on the Clinical Research Center, and she presented with symptoms listed here, which I suspect most of you can relate to. They're, they're fairly typical symptoms reported in POTS patients. But she was carefully studied on the Clinical Research Center, and um, she had some of the tests that were just referred to. So, she had nerve, direct nerve recordings of the sympathetic nerve firing, as well as uh, measurements of norepinephrine level, which are, which are the neurotransmitter that the nerves use. And in a normal individual, which you see here, when you go from lying to standing, there's about a doubling of nerve activity and about a doubling of norepinephrine levels. But in this patient, the nerve activity didn't quite double, but the nerve activity did go up, maybe a little less than double, but the norepinephrine level went up a lot on standing. Right, so there was a dissociation between the two. The response wasn't normal. And we won't get into exactly how they did the studies, but they actually looked at norepinephrine clearance in this patient um, using studies that, you know, honestly, I, I don't think we do it. We haven't done it in Vanderbilt in years. Dr. Goldstein might be one of the only ones that still does them. And showed that the clearance, the ability to get rid of norepinephrine, was abnormal in this patient. And this cartoon illustrates hopefully why. So this is a schematic or a cartoon of a norepinephrine synapse. On the top is the presynaptic end where the little balls or vesicles release little red dots of norepinephrine. And then the bottom part is the postsynaptic end with little receptors that are the business end. That's actually what does stuff. Squish vessels, raises heart rates. It's based on the norepinephrine um, attacking the receptors. But when you release the norepinephrine, the vast majority of it normally gets taken up by these transporters called NET, or the norepinephrine transporter, or uptake one. Think of them as vacuum cleaners sucking up the norepinephrine back from the synapse. That's how you get rid of it. The problem is that if the norepinephrine transporter doesn't work, then when you release norepinephrine, it doesn't go away as easily, and more of it works on the receptors. Right? So effectively, you get more bang for your buck, and that can lead to this hyperadrenergic or revved up state. And the net effect is an increase in sympathetic tone. So, in this individual, and it turns out her twin sister, there was actually a mutation in the gene coding the norepinephrine transporter that caused it not to work. And 
there was a field trip out to a family reunion where they collected lots of blood and heart rates on family members, and family members with the mutation had higher heart rates than those without. So this was great, you know, because it was the late 90s, um, paper been published in the New England Journal in 2000, so life was good, and we figured out the cause of POTS, right? There was a gene. So um, over the next decade or so, we screened patients at Vanderbilt um, for this mutation, and this was sort of the entire list of patients, other patients that had that mutation. Right, so this was a bit dispiriting because it seemed like it made sense, there was a physiologic mechanism, but no one else had it. So um, it turns out, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit of a genetics um, agnostic, and I feel bad saying that here where uh, both people in the organization and probably NINDS want to fund a lot of the genetics work, but the reality is genes are important, but genes are a roadmap. Genes are a guide, it's a, it's a mission statement. Genes don't do anything, right? As was pointed out, it's actually the proteins that do stuff, and you have to get from the genes to the protein through RNA, right? So there's lots of places where this can go wrong. Keep that in mind. So this field almost died until some work from Australia. So Murray Esler's group at the Baker Institute um, started doing vein biopsies on some patients. Um, re the reality is Australians are tough. You know, they can put up with a lot of this crap. It's hard to, to do in North America. But they do vein biopsies, and they mushed it up, and they did gels and looked at protein levels. And what they found in this paper was that, you know, you can see the 80 kilodalton level. If you look at the gels on the left, these are the healthy subjects, a small number, and they had goodly levels of norepinephrine transporter protein. If you look at the POTS patients, the answer isn't that they have it or they don't. The answer is there's variability, right? So some patients had it. We want one patient looks normal. One patient looks like it's there but not quite normal. And there are a few patients where it looks like it's not there at all. Right? So overall, there was more in the control subjects than the POTS patients, but the variability, I think, is part of the, the answer here. Um, there's other evidence of this variability. So this is data from MIBG scanning from Europe where they found about 20% of POTS patients didn't take up this tracer in the heart that is taken up through the norepinephrine transporter. So there are different explanations for this, but one is if their transporter's not working, they wouldn't take this up. And so that was about 20% in that series. So then the question is why? You know, you have, you know, this evidence of variable activity, but the genes are okay. Why does it happen? And this also came from that same Australian group a few years ago that suggested there was an epigenetic mechanism at play. So there was an issue of gene silencing. Um, and quite frankly, I'm not smart enough to discuss gene silencing in a meaningful way, except to say that um, it has to do with the settlation of um, histones or proteins around the DNA that make it inaccessible. Right? So this is part of going from the master plan or the vision statement down to operationally, things change and are regulated, and these are being regulated perhaps in a bad way in some patients. So getting down to business, this is the pointy end of the spear model, right? So what we really want to know about is not even protein. I probably should have had another arrow to protein function because you can have protein that doesn't work. What we care about is what it does. The DNA clearly is not telling us that. If the DNA is abnormal, not working, you're out of luck, but that doesn't happen often. So we could try and look at the protein, but you'd have to give me your arm and we'd have to cut things open and take it out. And let's face it, we're not getting a lot of volunteers for that. So the question is, can we use RNA. So the nice thing about RNA uh, is that in many cases you can actually measure this from a peripheral blood sample. Like it's the type of sample you'd get at the lab in your doctor's office. So the Murray Esler group has started using that, the Australian group. But what we don't know is whether it actually says what we think it says. Does it actually relate to the function of the protein, to what the norepinephrine transporter is supposed to do? And that's what this project is about that we're doing at the meeting here right now, actually. So the re rationale is that the net, the norepinephrine transport mRNA is actually easy to measure. By easy to measure, don't know how to do it, but I can get the samples and we can send it to a lab that can do it for us and give us an output. Um, and if it does work, this is a much simpler way of assessing something that right now is very difficult to assess. We'll talk about the implications in a couple minutes. Um, in terms of the who's eligible for the study, Really, it's anyone that has a norepinephrine transporter and some norepinephrine in them. So that's pretty much everyone. The primary question is, do they relate across the spectrum? 
Secondarily, we may try and look at a comparison between POTS patients and not, but the primary issue doesn't, isn't, primary, isn't about POTS per se. Um, we're looking at patients aged 13 to 80, men and women. If you're under 18, we'll need parental consent as well as your permission in an assent form. I will say that um, we were restricted to 100 people signing up, and as, uh, after last night and this morning, we've actually closed enrollment unless someone drops out. Right? So we've actually, people have shown great interest, and we appreciate that. There were many of you that showed interest that weren't eligible, and this is why. Many of you are on drugs that directly block the norepinephrine transporter. And the problem is, if we're looking at the relationship between the RNA, at messenger RNA level, and the transporter function, we don't want that relationship affected by these drugs. And so, drugs that are listed here that basically fall into categories of uh, drugs that you can go to jail for, that's the cocaine and MDMA, um, amphetamine-like drugs, um, SNRI drugs, not SSRI, but the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, because the norepinephrine reuptake is what we're looking at, um, and uh, atomoxygen fills in that as an ADHD drugs, and, and some tricyclics, because quite frankly, they're dirty drugs that affect everything. The exam itself involves, you know, height, weight, and some bite and scoring as a physical, uh, brief physical, um, orthostatic vital signs, and orthostatic blood work. So the plan is to put an IV catheter in you and draw blood lying and standing. Um, the rubber has hit the road this morning. We're already having some trouble with some of that, and so if we're, not able to, if we're only able to get the supine blood work, we may have to skip the standing blood work, but we're going to try a few times and, uh, and see what we can do. Try not to wear your compression stockings if you, to the study. Um, we need to be able to look at your legs during the study. Um, so it's, it's under two tablespoons of blood. It's, it's for catecholamines largely, so norepinephrine and its metabolites, um, as well as the RNA, as well as a few other samples. There's also a urine sample. Importantly, this is not a 24-hour urine sample. I think I brought that up with Lauren, and she, I think, was going to hit me over the phone when I suggested that about 100 people would be carrying around orange jugs to the meeting. Um, so this is a spot urine sample. Now, you don't need to wait until the blood to get the urine. Those of you who have signed up for the study, if you go to the study room, which is Great Falls, um, you can pick up the urine collection. There's a piece of paper that I need you to fill out that asks anything you've eaten in the 24 hours before the urine collection, as well as the time of the urine collection. The bathroom is very near the study room. After you void, please drop the sample off right away, because we need to process it within a couple of minutes. Um, but we need the form information as well, so we can understand the results. You can do that before your scheduled slot. Those of you who've signed up have a scheduled 30-minute time slot, but that's focused on the blood work and the vitals. The urine can be done beforehand. And then we'll send you a link for an online REDCap survey within the week or so. Um, please complete that and return that. One of the questions we had yesterday commonly is, will I get the results? And that is, yes, but. Um, so the catecholamine or catechol results we'll share with you once they're processed. Um, that can take a while. Um, the window I'm giving us is 12 months. It might be sooner. Um, it really depends on how quickly we can get them processed and run. Officially, they're being done for research purposes. Our ethics, the Vanderbilt Ethics Board, has made me write on the consent form that I cannot provide you clinical interpretation with these results. And in fact, probably you're not supposed to use them for clinical use. Once I give you the results, I'm not going to police what you do with the results. You do with it as you wish. We will share. I need to mail it to you, not email it to you. We cannot email out these results. So we will be asking for your address on the online REDCap survey as well as on paper. If we can't read your writing, and you mistype it on REDCap, you may never see them. So be careful about that. Will you get paid? No. <laughs> OK, so the consent part is a bit out of date. Uh, most people have consented. If you're desperately interested and you haven't consented, um, if you go and check in, we can try and keep you on a waiting list. As I said, we're limited by certain blood tubes, and so if patients we're not able to get blood from them, for example, we may be able to backfill with a few people, but it'll only be a handful. Um, there are study numbers on the urine cups and on the tubes. Please keep those together. Don't exchange cups with other people. That'll really mess us up. Similarly, the red cap survey, especially if there are more than one of you in a family, I hope you gave us separate email addresses, because the red cap surveys are linked to you as an individual. So if there are two of you, you'll get two different links. Try not to mix and match that. So I told you I'd come back to the who cares part of this. Why does this matter? So one issue, even though there are only the two 
patients that actually have this mutation, this has actually been helpful information because, as you saw, there are a lot of drugs that many of you are on, as I found out last night, that block the norepinephrine transporter. And we did, did a study when I was at Vanderbilt looking at the effects on heart rate and, and orthostatic tachycardia of atomoxetine, um, which is Stratera, an ADHD drug that blocks this transporter. And you can see in red that the patients that took the atomoxetine as opposed to the placebo in black had their heart rates on standing and sitting increase, not decrease. And that was associated with more orthostatic tachycardia, and importantly, that was associated with a worsening of symptoms. Now, the truth is, I presented summary data here, but two-thirds of these patients reported a worsening of symptoms, and one-third didn't. So again, there's heterogeneity. And we're hoping that studies like this might help us understand why there's that heterogeneity, why we can't treat all POTS patients the same. We need to understand some of these individual differences and act accordingly. When people say personalized medicine, it seems like all the money is going to genetics. But the truth is, this is personalized medicine. Personalized medicine is about understanding what makes you different and how to treat you better. That's what we're trying to do here. Thank you. So I want to apologize for a moment. Um, this slide set was used at a, at a webinar that some of you may have seen a month ago. Um, it doesn't list our other collaborators. So importantly on the slide, on the more recent version, um, this, this is a huge effort and it's, it's caused a lot of aggravation. Um, I know I've aggregated Lauren a fair bit, but a lot of efforts on the part of Dysautonomy International. Um, David Goldstein is critical to this effort, both in terms of running the samples and, and helping us with the coordination. Um, we've brought people down from the University of Calgary, we brought people up from Vanderbilt. There's a colleague who is a part-time Vanderbilt faculty like I am, who's in uh, Penn State. People, we've had 13 people come in to try and run the study. We've effectively set up a lab for rapid processing and freezing of samples um, in the study room. Um, I was in the elevator a couple of days ago at Foothills Hospital and an older guy in his 70s or 80s was sort of sideways staring at me and after a few floors he looked, he sort of started talking and said, you have gray hair. <laughs> so I paused for a moment and said, I blame it on my kids, but what I should have said is, it's the study, it's the stress. Um, anyway, thank you for those who are participating and, and those who weren't eligible but interested, we appreciate it. Obviously, this doesn't happen without your interest and your support. Um, if you have questions, we're around to answer it. We're in the Great Falls room, and uh, hope you have a good meeting. <laughs>